Hi, Rob Brown here with one of our talent specials on the Accounting Influencers podcast. I'm thrilled with, to have with me today an international star and expert on culture, diversity, talent, people, the Latino American surgeons in the world. It's Juana Bordas. Hello to you. <laughs> Fabulous pronunciation, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I do try a, a, an English boy from the north here, but uh, we are an international show and you're truly an international guest. Uh, Juana, for people that have not met you and your work yet, tell us a little bit about what you love speaking and writing about. Well, um, you know, I'm an elder in my community and we're going through this incredible generational change in the world, um, you know, where uh, the millennials and Z's is what they call them in, in our country are the largest generation and 10,000 baby boomers in the United States, they um, retire every day. So we have this transition all over the world. Um, and yet in many communities, and this is what I talk about, the role of the elder is a very important role. You know, we are kind of the bridge between generations and we're also here to share our experiences and perspectives. So I've been working for a very long time and, you know, our careers progress. The more you do what you're going to do, the larger the scope, the more the impact and what you do. So today I actually teach diversity and inclusion and leadership. Leadership is my specialty because we can't create the kind of world where everyone's respected and we're tapping into the talents of all the different cultures and ethnic groups and nationalities unless we really have leadership that reflects different cultures, nationalities and uh, people and ages. And so, um, and so it's a real key thing. If we really want to create a multicultural global world, uh, we need to have leaders of every persuasion, every culture uh, at the table. And so that's kind of my job is helping people really think about that and think of the assets that that brings when you bring different people to the table, the different perspectives, you know, the, the different experiences um, and the different ways of working together. So well, it's, a, it's to me, I like to say there's no downside to diversity. It's just going to include and expand who we are as humanity. Well, when we speak about accounting uh, as a sector, you'll be aware of this. You deal with many professional firms and uh, big corporate organizations. Wanna. Accountants have a reputation for being stale, male and pale. It's white, it's <laughs> middle class, it's full of baby boomers. But we know that 53% of accountants are women but 9% of them only are in leadership roles. So that speaks to culture and that's probably representative of many sectors. So tell us a little bit about how the world is changing and that the millennials are coming through or the younger generation are coming through, the baby boomers are dying off and we have to embrace- Well, don't say we're dying off, just well, say that we, <laughs> that we, have new, every day. <laughs> we have a new role in society. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, March 8th is International Women's Day. Yeah. And as, and as someone who has been involved in the women's movement since I was very young, because uh, I grew up in a very sexist society, as you can imagine. But today in the United States, it's about 45% of women are now in management roles. So we're getting there. Mm. If you look at the last century, one of the biggest impacts and one of the biggest changes in the world was the advent of women into leadership roles, into accounting, and, uh, you know, becoming, uh, we've, we have CEOs now. And in fact, by the way, studies show that if you have a, a woman CEO, it helps the bottom line. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that, and it's an example of diversity, is that women are, are more relationship oriented. You know, they, they are, our socialization has been about the family, the community. Women have done all the institutions in society, such as the schools and the churches, you know, that create the fabric of society. So when we get into leadership, we not only learn the skills that you need in order to be impactful and, and run an organization, but we bring our people skills with us, which is an amazing, amazing thing. And one of the reasons uh, that studies show that people prefer to work for a woman. <laughs> Well, not only that, we have statistics, Juana, that say that more and more women are starting businesses. So if they need professional advisors and help around them, better that they might be females as well, rather than having to relate to an old white guy. Well, let's not call them old white guys. <laughs> I'm being slightly controversial, but uh, you talk a lot about the Latino emergence, particularly in yeah. the US, yes. and they are 
representative of the majority of millennials out there, aren't they? And, and they region. certainly are. 60% of Latinos are millennials or younger. But that's true across the world. Like yeah. I said, half of the world is under 30. So this generational change that's going on is a, a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so everyone who's in leadership, and let me just say that leaders are not thinking about today. Yeah. That's not leadership. Leaders are thinking about five years from now, 10 years from now. They're also in tune with the trends that are coming. You know, when we were talking about women and Hispanics, I never dreamed as a little girl that, that women would be in the positions they are today. We just elected a Latina congresswoman in Colorado, where I'm from. I never dreamed we would have Latinas that are congresswomen. And on top of that, she's a pediatrician. That would not have happened in my childhood. You see what I mean? So leaders are looking at the future, understanding what's coming and preparing for that. That's what the cutting edge is. And so you, so you do need to know about these trends that we're gonna become more youthful, that we're gonna become more multicultural, that we're gonna become more global, that we're gonna become more digital, right? And so these kind of trends that, that, that uh, leaders are looking at are helping to prepare their organizations and their industry. Mm. you know, to be more accessible to people. And you speak a lot on generations, Juana. We have a, an issue in the accounting profession, probably the same in a lot of sectors, with the talent pool and the labor shortage. And younger people are quiet quitting or bugging out or doing their own thing. There's a shortage of people taking degrees. The degree is less prestigious than it used to be. So where is the talent coming from? And you speak to diversity and inclusion, and it really requires companies, professional firms to widen the church, to widen those gates and embrace all kinds of inclusion. Otherwise, they're not going to fill roles, are they? No, and, and you bring up a really good point. Um, and first of all, I wanted to say that Latinos are not just a... Um, a U.S. phenomenal. We're from 26 different countries. Right. So, of course, in Europe, it's it's Spain and and uh, and Portugal is also part of the Latino uh, fac family. Um, but what I was going to say is that we need to look at this as a way to enhance our organizations and really, in my perspective, to enhance humanity. So, what is it that we can learn from younger people? Number one is they want work life balance, and we know that in the past, even before. Uh, you know, women ascended to leadership, that a lot of people were stressed out, you know, they overworked uh, to get to the top meant you had to, you know, uh, sometimes even step on other people, you know, it was a very competitive kind of environment. Well, young people don't want that kind of competition. You know, they want, they want a leadership style where people share their talents. Mm -hmm. They want a leadership style where every person is respected for, for, you know, what they bring to the table. And, uh, and, and they want it so that there's this work-life balance. They also want corporations or organizations that have meaning and purpose. You know, so many of us, you know, you get on the fast track and you're working and do you stop to think, what is my life contributing, you know, and, and, and where do I want to be in 10 years? And when you look back on your life, what do you want to have, have achieved? Well, young people have a whole different sense on that. And one thing I really do love about them, because I do have a millennial daughter that I had in my 40s, uh, you know, they connect with each other. Mm. It's just amazing to me, this, this connection that they have. Um, they don't necessarily know each other, but they connect through technology and they really have that sense of, you know, we're in this together. One thing I learned about young people that really fits well with many cultures is that they also want to get to know you. Who are you? What's your story? What's your narrative? And I think that fits in with the global uh, community that we're building. Because you and I don't know each other, but if we spent some time talking about our history, our parents, our values, where we came from, and when I do this with corporations, you know, and, and we take time to do that, they say, you know, Juana, I worked with Rob 20 years, but I never really knew him. Yeah. Uh, and I just had a, a podcast I had with somebody and we started talking about his father and what he learned from his father. These the millennials really want and, and Z's and so forth because they are so scattered, because, you know, one in five people moves every year, because we don't grow up in intact communities anymore. In the past, we would have known each other's grandparents, right? Um, they want to know who are you. And I think that really enriches work. We can't look at work and life separate. We have to understand that we spend most of our time at work and how can we make that an environment that nurtures people, that grows people, that connects people.
Mm, that's so good. Let's talk about technology for a moment, Tuana, because this younger generation, the digital natives, we know that. Are they more or less connected now than, say, we were in our generation? Because, yeah, we lived on each other's streets. We walked the corridors of a business. We knocked on the door. We were all in the same office. But these days, a business can be international and multi-officed and global and hybrid. And yes, they've got all the tools and the social media and everything else to say we are connected. But do they really know each other and build relationships like perhaps we did? I think it's different, you know, than we are. I mean, I remember when I first got on Facebook, I would go, how can they have this many friends? You know, Because <laughs> we define friendship differently. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, again, I really believe in intergenerational leadership. My new book, The Power of Latino Leadership Ahora, has a whole chapter on working together across generations. They need to learn from us. We need to learn from them. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think one of the things we contribute is that whole idea of that relationships take time, that relationships should be a little deeper than just, you know, connecting, um, you know, through the Internet. Um, I have a, a, a fabulous grandson, by the way, who's um, 24. And at one point he was getting like uh, 84, 840 likes on his phone and stuff. And I said, what's going on? And finally he said, I'm getting off that. It ain't real. You see what I mean? So we need to get young people to understand that, yeah, it's great to connect. It's great to learn from each other. Where it is really helpful, by the way, for example, is that when young people go to do something, they can connect to a lot of people and get support, you mm -hmm. know, uh, especially when you're talking, for example, climate change. Th they can do these kinds of digital activism on a very large scale. And so they think different than we do. You know, we, we have to, especially as an accountant, you have to organize things, you have to have it in order, you have to do this, you have to do that. And they think a lot more globally because they've been on computers. My daughter got on a computer when she was two years old. And now the babies, the babies are watching things on their phones, you mm. know, five, six years old. And so they have a whole different connection and we can help them see that, yeah, this is great. We do need to be connected. We do need to have that sense of global community, but we need to be real people. We need to share our stories. We need to connect. Juana, your story is fascinating, how you came over from Nicaragua when you were young. Tell us a little bit about that and how it's shaped your life. I will, but I also, you know, want people to understand that um, we have so much immigration in the world today. You've had it in England, you've had it across the world, you know, mm. uh, and being driven by a lot of things, not just economic, but climate change and uh, political situations. So my situation was that there was a tsunami in Nicaragua that wiped out the coast where my ancestors were from. And so my father went up to the mountains and this is what I want to tell everybody. He was a bookkeeper. <laughs> he went up to the Bonanza mine and he kept the books and so forth. Wow. And the way I got comfortable with numbers is when I was a child, he used to do income tax as a sideline on, you know, tax time. Amazing. And he would have me add everything up and help him. So, you know, way back when I was a child, I, I learned to love numbers. And then I love to learn money that is also numbers, right? Because you have to keep track of the money. But anyway, so my family's up in the mountains of Nicaragua and had lost everything. And that's what happens to a lot of immigrants. You know, we have this, this terrible situation on our borders, but you don't leave your home, your country, your language, your community, and most of all, the respect that you have in your community. You know, you're somebody there you know, just for a, an aventura, just for an adventure, you leave because, you know, you want a better life for your children. Yes. And that's why I admire immigrants so much. And by the way, in the United States, 33% of the Latino community are immigrants from mainly from Mexico and Central America, but it's, and, and South America, but it's economic and, and political things that drive this immigration. So anyway, so here's my father, he saves enough money doing this um, bookkeeping and, and keeping the, the commissary at the mine running that he and my older sisters come to the United States to earn money to bring their family to America, to the uh -huh. promised land, right? And so my mother and me and five of her children, there were, she, we had eight children in the family, which you have to realize this is 1945. So I'm an oldie but goodie. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So we get, you know, so so I have a picture of us getting on that boat and we look like refugees, you know, because that's what we were, right? Mm -hmm. But what I want people to get 
is that not only did my parents make this tremendous sacrifice to leave and to come to a strange land where my mother couldn't even speak the language and had a fifth grade education, but they had vision, you know, they had a purpose, they had stamina, they had determination, they had resourcefulness. And when I'm growing up as a poor little Latina in, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, I thought I was, you know, uh, kind of deprived, but as I looked at my life and I looked at the lessons my parents showed me and I looked at the dream that they had for me, um, I all of a sudden understood that I really come from greatness. These immigrants mm -hmm. that are coming, they have a vision for the future. They have stamina. They're innovative. You know, they're risk takers. And so it helped me transform my life to be able to see my humble background and my first memory is being in the hall of a banana boat because people don't get first class tickets when they immigrate. We're in the uh -huh. hall. And this big banana boat had this small room in the back with bunk beds where they would transport people. And my brother says to me, would you like a banana? So I guess we ate a lot of bananas. On <laughs> and so when we came to the United States, um, you know, it, it was that, that, that sacrifice and determination of my parents. And as the youngest daughter, I was very blessed to have my whole family believe in me. That's what happens. You know, you get an Asian group that comes over and they groom one of their own mm. to become successful and to move the family forward. And I'm so proud that today my daughters, my three daughters have advanced degrees and the door has been open. You should see the contributions my family's making. All four of my brothers served in the military. Uh, you know, we're getting degrees, we're helping. My, my, my niece has her own architectural firm in Texas. Immigrants can do great things because we are that cutting edge of people that want that opportunity that we seek. I'm so glad you're championing in the immigrants because here in the UK, as much as anywhere, immigrants are largely misunderstood. There's loyalists and nationalists and traditionalists that want to keep their jobs and want to preserve the integrity of their nation. But we can't get away from the work ethic of immigrants and how they contribute to the labor pool at all levels. And we can't survive in professional services like accounting firms without immigrants, can we? We've got to embrace multiculturalism. What happens if firms don't want to? Well, I was also going to say that COVID is a great lesson on that, because when you look at the uh, essential workers, those that were on the front line serving the food, growing the food. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the immigrants do that basic services, yes. whether it's taking care of our children so we can work, you know, or taking care of our elderly when we can't take care of our parents. Um, you know, so like my mother scrubbed floors. I mean, she worked in a school lunchroom six days a week, and then she babysat at the church uh, on Sundays, um, which was a, a big job from 630 in the morning till like two in the afternoon. And so when you look at the sacrifices that they make in order to help our, our society, you know, work, um, I think I think that's where they make such a great contribution. Um, it, remind me the question that you just asked, though, because I was talking about. I was asking you what will happen to the companies that don't embrace multiculturalism and leave uh, diversity until the last minute, until it's a burning platform, if you like. Well, I'll tell you one thing that's going to happen, um, and and a lot of people may not care too much about this, but your grandchildren are going to be mixed. Yeah. It's already true in the United States that 50% of the millennials and Zs identify as multicultural. Wow. And it's not necessarily that I got to go marry somebody outside of my culture. It's how do I embrace the gifts and assets that every culture brings? You know, every culture has different contributions to make. We talked a little bit about women. Let's talk about Latinos. 78% of the, of the new entries into the U.S. labor force in the next 10 years will be Latinos. Goodness. Why? Because we know population is not growing. Mm -hmm. And we know that the Latino community and some of our immigrant communities are here to take. It's not that they're going to take jobs. It's that we don't have enough people to fill the jobs, right? Yes. And so, and so Latinos bring very hard work to the table, but we also love to celebrate life. We're a very celebratory culture and we spend more money on food and fiestas. We invented the word fiestas, you know, and, and, and uh, technology because we like to connect with each other. We go to movies more. So our philosophy is work hard, but enjoy life, you know? Yes. 
enjoy your family. And so when people look at becoming multicultural, I want them to look at it as not only the next step in, in human evolution for all of us to become a, a more multicultural, diverse family, but to look at what is it going to bring me? You know, the, the, the emphasis that, that Asians have on education and, and you know, their, their philosophies based on Confucius, which has got to do with knowledge. Well, we can all use that. You know, we can all become smarter. We can all emphasize growth and education. So each culture brings these gifts. And think about the Black community in the United States that taught us that you can overcome slavery and become a community that not only stays together, but has in their heart the whole idea of equality and, and, and inclusion for people. I so, love that. so, so there, like I say, there's no downside to this. Yeah. What advice would you give to leaders that want to promote a more diverse, inclusive culture in their companies? Wanna... Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, in, in my writing, um, I talk about different principles that flow out of diverse communities. One of them, which I think is very important, is called the leader as equal. The leader is equal. So we've grown up in a society where there was a lot of hierarchy, hierarchy and dominance, you know, our old organizational structures are still like that. And yet what we're looking at today is not only a more diverse uh, workforce, but millennials and young people are the most educated generation as well. So we have a more educated workforce, a more diverse workforce, and we have economies where we want or or in your business, for example, you want people to be self-managed, you want them to be knowledgeable, and you want them to be self-starters and, and, and to be committed to the organization. Yeah. Well, the way you do that is for the leader to treat everybody with respect, to understand that it doesn't matter what their jobs are, they're an important piece of the organization. So you treat the people that clean, the IT people, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the people that provide your services, you treat them with the same respect. But more than that, the leader is looking at, how can I develop that person? What can I do to help them reach their potential? How can I bring people together to have a shared vision where everybody's committed? Well, you do that first, by having a deep respect for every person you meet and every person that works for you. And you need to know them. Like we said, share your narratives. What are their aspirations? What are their gifts and assets? What are their challenges? And so it's a type of leadership that really is people-centered. And that's how communities of color and, and, and collective communities, that's how they've survived. Mm. There's a phrase called employer brand, which you may have heard of. Corporate brand is what we present as a company, as an organization to the outside world. But employer brand is to what degree do we show the talent out there that we are a great place to work? So when you look at, say, accounting firms, most of their websites look the same. Why do they make the same promises? You you'd go to the about us section and people kind of look the same and they're the same kind of age. So you talked about how the younger generations want to buy into a narrative and capture a story and be part of a vision that really compels them. Talk a little bit about how professional firms can attract good talent by telling a good story and getting them involved in how they're growing. Uh, well, we were talking a little bit about this earlier. Young people are looking for purpose. Yeah for meaning in life. And you know, when you do look at technology, a lot of times technology doesn't give you that. It is the human relationships and those connections that give you that. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work with corporations in the United States, helping them. Now you have to realize that, the, that this is very different for global people. They may not even understand the, the, the racial um, past of the United States, but it is, it's something that we grapple with, you know, because of the different uh, problems we've had with racism, discrimination, slavery, colonization, imperialism, I could go on. But, but the thing is, is that today, people are looking for and corporations are investing in their diverse talent. So I do a lot of work with, uh, for example, I, I just did some work with Microsoft, uh, helping them develop their Latino talent and promote their Latino talent. They made a five-year commitment to work with African-Americans and Latinos to bring them into the higher levels of leadership. Because if I'm gonna join up, I wanna know, is there an opportunity here? Uh, do, do we have the leadership path open to different people? 
And when, when you look at millennials, they want you to be socially responsible. They want you to have a connection with the community. They're not so interested in working with large accounting firms that don't have that sense of we're good corporate citizens. And I think that's a positive again, you know, because leadership is really creating a society that takes care of its people. You know, how are you going to have a good company if people don't have the money to buy your services or the products that you represent uh, are, are not, uh, you know, they're not going to buy those because, you know, they don't have a, a minimum wage. They don't have a wage that can afford them that. So, you know, it's kind of like uh, the tide lifting all the boats. We, we want to lift the boats. We want to make sure that, that uh, you know, that people work for corporations where there's that connection to people. There's that connection to the community. Yes, we want to make a profit, but we also value uh, life work balance. Mm, so good. And uh, I just want to touch on the women aspect of things. As a father of two daughters, the Women's Day is coming up on March 8th. As you say, I'm judging some awards for women in accounting. I recently completed a series of 14 panels with senior female leaders in accounting and fintech. There's so much going on in the, the working life of a woman from childbirth and, and menopause and everything in between, but they are a fundamental part of the leadership fabric of society, aren't they? Oh, yes. Um, you know, the thing is, and, and I think we're still going through paradigm shifts take time. I mean, you sure. have to realize women got the vote a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah. And so we're seeing this transition. And I always say that Latinos are the 21st century, what women were to the 20th century. Okay. Because if you would have walked into an accounting firm even 50 years ago, it wouldn't look like it is today. So we're going sure. through this transition of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I do think one of the most important things is that, you know, now we have maternity leave, which can be for both men and women. Um, we now have, you know, the ability to work some from home, which will help with the home and the work-life balance. And so I think as, as different people step into leadership roles, the question has to be, what are they doing for the organization to make it uh, more user-friendly for women? To, and, and I include men in that. I mean, we're trying to build a partnership society, not women being in charge or men being in charge, but how can we work together? to build a, um, an organization that really supports both men and women and supports their families. And I really think that, um, that if we don't do that, then I don't know if you remember, but in the old days, um, executives used to have high blood pressure, heart attacks, et cetera, yeah. because there was so much stress you know, at the top. Um, we need to change that. And we change that through another principle, by the way, which is collaborative multicultural leadership, which I call leadership by the many. If somebody in the top can, can motivate their people to really be self-starting, committed employees, then they don't have to be there every minute because they know their people are doing their job. Mm. Well, now this has been terrific today. It's been uh, such a, an honor to share a little bit of time with you and hear your stories. We'll put your contact details in our show notes. Just tell us quickly how you help organizations with the stuff that you do. Well, um, first of all, like I say, I have a, a new book being released March 28th, uh, The Power of Latino Leadership, Ahora, so they can order that on Amazon. Um, and uh, what I do with corporations, but I also work with schools, and, and I've done a, a lot of programs to get diverse superintendents so that the schools will also reflect a multicultural um, leadership cadre, um, and I've worked with government. So the whole idea is to work with leaders so that they understand and they are committed to a more diverse and inclusive way of leading and tapping into the talents of their people. And this means everything from how you hire people to how you train people. We need to remember that when women first started stepping into leadership in the 90s, there were special leadership programs, there was mentoring, there was shadowing, there was coaching, and we need to keep doing that kind of, um, uh, we need to keep offering those kind of services in order to prepare people, because what you really want to do is prepare them to be able to be leaders across the, the company or the corporation. And so I've, I've had a lot of success. I'll give you one that, I, that I'm very proud of. The Chevron Corporation, I designed a, a, like a four-session, and it was during COVID, so that's a four-session leadership program, and I've worked with them on the ground now. They had a 4,000% increase in Latinos across the world that joined their organization uh, to help promote Latinos at Chevron. 
And, uh, and when you get that, you know, uh, kind of uh, involvement that people want to participate, the organization gets a certain energy and vibrancy because they know that here comes the new, the young, uh, the, the talented, the future, and that they're preparing for, for, for that time. Well, when aboard Bordas, that's been such a privilege to talk to you today. Thank you so much for your passion and your insights. And thank you for keeping all our accounting together. <laughs> I really appreciate having this time to share.